So my name is Eloise Hansen. I am the news editor at Boutique Hotel News. We are an online B2B source for the boutique, luxury and lifestyle hotel sector published by International Hospitality Media. Along with our events, we also run two other sites, uh, Service Department News and Short Term Rentals. So here's our trailblazers today, and I would like to invite each to introduce themselves. And again, all their contact details are going to be posted in the chat for you to connect with via LinkedIn. So let's hand over to Vajrana first. Would you please like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for making the time to, uh, to join our little discussion. Uh, my name is Vajrana Riley. I'm a founder and CEO of CL Capital and also co-founder of Stowaway. We're asset managers and owner developers of hotels. And uh, we, we tend to focus on the UK, but have some, uh, some interesting positions in Europe as well. Thanks, Vajrana. And Dan? Good morning, everybody. I'm Doug Hersher. I'm a founder and managing director of Robert Douglas, a boutique investment bank specializing on raising capital in the hospitality and experiential space. Uh, we've been very active in particular with boutique hotels as well as new concepts in the outdoor leisure sector, uh, kind of commonly referred to as glamping, but uh, we've looked at a lot of those transactions. Uh, we also have a small merchant banking platform and make investments uh, for the firm uh, alongside uh, clients and customers of the firm. Thanks, Doug. And Dan, can I hand over to you, please? Yeah, thanks, Eloise. Hi, uh, my name's Dan Williams. I'm the head of hotel and real estate finance at Clydesdale Bank. So I head up a, a nationwide team of specialists focused purely on, uh, on hotel lending with a UK wide remit. So historically as a bank, we've uh, covered the whole spectrum of hospitality. Um, but in the recent cycle, we've been very selective in terms of our approach to the, to the sector. Um, we've got a clear focus now around experienced developers and operators, uh, well equitized borrowers in the strongest locations across the UK. Um, our minimum debt size is around the 10 million pound mark, and that's uh, led us towards leading primarily in London and also in, in other key big cities and airports across the UK as well. Um, that combination really of borrower and asset is the absolute fundamental driver for us in all of our transactions. Um, we have done various development transactions as well as um, brand repositionings and the more vanilla refinance of existing hotel stock. Um, we fund across the asset classes, uh, sorry, across the classes from the likes of budget, uh, limited service all the way through to uh, upper upscale. But the boutique and lifestyle has really played a big part in terms of our lending in recent years. You know, they're always unique and interesting projects to be involved with and clearly resonate with the public as well, given the success that, uh, that they've enjoyed in recent years. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Dan. And Patrick, can I hand over to you, please? Well, Patrick, uh, you may be on mute, if I can hand over to yourself. Hi, okay. this is Patrick, CEO of Fair Valley Capital. We're an advisory business with a small family office attached to us, which does make some principal investments. On the advisory side, we've executed about 400 million pounds sterling of investments in the last three years. The majority of those transactions have been in boutique hotels. We're active, um, we have been active in terms of getting deals done in, in the UK, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, and in Greece. We're now looking uh, to expand our footprint into the US and uh, working on both development and asset, uh, asset acquisition opportunities. The, the types of deal that we have executed have either been asset transactions or financings. And the, the size of deals that we've worked on have ranged from 2 million uh, executed to 95 million executed. Brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. And last but not least, Tim, please. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Tim L, Chief Operating Officer of Overlow Hotels Group. 
Uh, we are an owner operator of boutique lifestyle uh, properties headquartered out of Hong Kong, uh, but with presence across uh, all major cities in Australia, uh, Bar Perth and, and most recently almost uh, ready to debut in Bali in Indonesia. So not only do we, do we own, but we also operate our assets under two different brands, either our Overlo Hotels brand or our Buy Overlo Collective uh, which gives us a lot more flexibility when it comes to the real estate investment side uh, of our business. Uh, and we continue to look to grow uh, our portfolio uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time looking at both uh, the UK or the US as, as one or the other uh, for our first step into the uh, more of an international market. Thanks, Tim. And thanks all. So before we get started, I am going to run us through some headlines that are relevant to our discussion on investment and finance. So the top left story provides an overview of European hotel transactions for the first half of 2020. Around 80% of the 5.7 billion euros recorded was agreed before the COVID outbreak with the most active buyers during the first six months being institutional investors. The UK marked the highest volume market for hotel investment followed by Germany. So looking at the UK then, the bottom left story highlights that approximately 1.7 pounds, 1.7 billion pounds worth of hotels were transacted, transacted in the first of 2020, which is about 36% down on the same period in 2019. The story mentions that there's been an absence of large-scale deals, though a growing number of smaller-scale transactions, mainly seen in the regional markets. Investor and developer interest is expected to rise in seaside locations as a result of the staycation boom, and we are likely to touch on this in today's conversation. I am back. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. I panicked, my screen went blank, but I am back. So I would like to kick off our first question. Dan, please may I ask this first question to you, please. Um, if you are able to give us an overview of what you are seeing across uh, the key markets in the UK and your activity here. Yeah, no problem, Eloise, and hopefully you can see me now as well. I think I have a bit of a technical issue here this end as well, uh, so apologies for that. But look, um, yeah, look, we recognise this has been a uniquely difficult period for, for hoteliers. Um, so in terms of what we've been doing as a bank, I think the, the key the key strategy has really been one of support, you know, to look to support the, the hoteliers out there as best we can to support our customers in every way possible. Um, you've already mentioned this weekend's announcement is clearly unwelcome. Uh, it's going to cause further issues for the sectors. That's that is clear. Um, and so, yeah, the bank's role really is one of support. As I say, um, you know, from the early period, we we're providing a full suite of covenant waivers to all of our existing borrowers, um, valuation waivers, capital repayment, holidays. Um, they extended for a number of quarters. I'm pleased to say we've also recently got buying from our risk teams to extend that out for a couple of quarters into early next year as well. You know, the real purpose of that being that the hoteliers can focus on managing their businesses. They're not having to worry about their their bank uh, being on their backs. I think that's been a pretty consistent message as well from the, the lender community out there to try and support as best as possible. There's also then been the, the various government support uh, loans, the bounce backs, the civils, the kill bills, 
um, that again we've looked to implement wherever possible. You know, it's not quite the silver bullet that um, I think the government might like you to have believed in the early days, but where, wherever it was possible, we have implemented them. And again, they've been very well received by our customer base. Um, and that a lot of the lending we're doing is in London. I don't think it's any a surprise to anyone that London has been particularly hard hit, given the amount of overseas business, given the amount of corporate business that comes into into London in, in ordinary years. Um, but then I, I suppose it's also fair to say that there have still been winners and losers across London even. Um, so, you know, the, from the one end of the spectrum, you've got the five star hotels. Some of them were looking to open up in the near future. Other ones early next year, I'm sure the announcement over the weekend means everyone's having to revisit that strategy, which is, as I say, very unfortunate. Um, you've also had the kind of mice reliant business. So the, the events and the, the conferencing, which again suffered really badly and, and continues to suffer. It's quite hard to see when, when some of that business is going to be coming back. Um, and then there's also, I guess, some of the more nuanced points. And I think even talking to our hoteliers, they didn't quite realise in some instances, for example, when you cl you're located close to, to transport hubs, but you're close to the West End, so you're Paddington, King's Cross, Victoria, Waterloo. Um, you kind of see yourself as part of a wider London market driven by the, the main London demand drivers, but actually quite a lot of that business does come in. If you take Paddington as an example, you know, the, the transport into Paddington as a hub and via the Heathrow Express and from Heathrow itself, you know, as that market has dried up, it's made it particularly challenging for those kind of sub-markets. But equally, you know, I think we should remember there have been some successes as well, and I look particularly to the service department world, um, where I guess it's relative rather than absolute terms, but they've done they've done pretty well on the whole. Um, you know, they tended to stay open through the whole the first lockdown period. Um, they have taken up a lot of business. People who were in London, either by choice as contractors or who were stuck here, tended to gravitate towards service department schemes, um, given the additional security, the in-room amenities they've been able to offer. And I think they have been one of the success stories um, through the past few months. And equally, I guess, you know, you, you talk to some of the borrowers, some hotels stayed open, some were closed during that first lockdown. Um, and some of those that stayed open throughout do seem to have picked up some business and some additional contracts, even once other hotels have opened up. You know, we're talking a relatively small piece of it, a small pie, but equally, I think at the moment, you know, every, every this already does help. So anything that can help the business, that's been positive. Um, and in terms of the second part of your, uh, your question, in terms of how our strategies changed. So look, it is, it is very difficult to lend into the sector at the moment. You know, our, <clears throat> our um, loans are structured around recent trading performance and then also forecast performance over the next few years. And forecasting right now, certainly for the next kind of six, 12 months is practically impossible. Yeah. So it's something we're not even really asking our existing customers to be doing right now. Um, but in terms of the sort of new, new lending, I'm pleased to say we are lending. You know, you kindly put up one of those slides, uh, including one of the deals that we did earlier this month, which is very good of you, Eloise. Um, but we've kind of arrived at a structure now where we're still very selective in terms of our appetite. Um, we kind of have to be ticking all of those boxes, you know, the strength of the borrower, their financial backing, the quality of those assets um, is absolutely crucial. But, you know, with the implementation of a couple of additional risk measures, you know, we're building in some working capital into our facilities. We're building in some interest cover into our facilities. The, the metrics are dialed back. I don't suppose that would surprise anybody really in terms of what we're doing. But we've arrived at a position where our risk colleagues are satisfied. Uh, and also, our, you know, we've got some customers who are, for whom these, uh, these structures are working. So as I say, we, we did a deal earlier this month. We've got a couple more in the, in the pipeline. I hope we'll draw soon. So yeah, we are pleased to say we're able to selectively still support new business. Thanks, Dan. And Doug, please may I um, hand over to yourself? I mean, what's your perspective being based in the US? I mean, are you seeing any changes in investor or lender criteria? Well, I think it's certainly if you compare pre-COVID to today, there have been enormous changes. And I think that Dan's comments around the way that traditional banks are looking at the hospitality space is absolutely the case here in North America. Uh, you know, for the most traditional lenders, and by that I mean the, the banks and insurance companies, pension plans, are out of the market for hospitality. They will make loans on hospitality assets for strong existing 
clients or for the very strongest borrowers. Um, but the financing is pretty conservative. And I, you know, what we're seeing is somewhere between 40 and 50% loan to value where value is the new V, not the, uh, not the old V. And, but in the situations where you can attract that financing, you are seeing pretty competitive pricing. Now spreads tend to be a little bit wider in the North American markets than they are in Europe. We're sort of looking at LIBOR plus 250 to 350 for bank loans. Where we do see a fair amount of activity is in the debt funds. So these are private lenders that really sort of came into, not into existence, but really kind of blossomed following the Great Recession. And those lenders are very active looking for deals. I think there's, we're still not seeing a lot of closed transactions, uh, but we're in the market with financing. So we're seeing quotes from those lenders as high as 60 to 65% loan to value. Again, where value is the new value, um, but spreads are much wider. If those lenders were at LIBOR plus 350 to 450 pre-COVID, today they're at LIBOR plus 550 at the very low end of the range and running up as high as kind of LIBOR plus 900. Um, you know, where the market is probably deepest is in the subordinate financing market where you've got mezzanine and preferred equity lenders looking at putting capital to work. And really what you're seeing in that market is traditional equity investors or, you know, what we would call value add or core plus investors coming into the hospitality market and putting capital to work at equity like pricing, but structured as financing. Um, you know, what I would say what everybody wants here, uh, operating loss reserves for at least six months debt service reserves for a minimum of 12 months, generally some kind of fresh equity coming into the transaction so that if you're funding interest reserves, if you're funding operating loss reserves, that capital is being contributed by the borrower is kind of an evidence of skin in the game. And then generally some kind of a lockout that restricts the borrower from refinancing the loan for some period of time. And that period of time might be as little as 12 months, probably more typically 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doug. And I'd like to um, look um, to Tim now. Um, you mentioned that you've, um, you know, you've got uh, the Volo Group and the Volo Collective. I believe that's 11 hotels with now more in the pipeline, Bali with looks to the UK and the US. Have you had to rethink your development strategy um, and what options have been available to yourself? You know, Nodding along there to what uh, what Doug was saying, uh, and I think I was unfortunately I was last there in, in, in early January looking at downtown A, um, and not long after that we, we we had a look at in a property in New York before the wheel really fell off. Uh, and what you're seeing obviously was a huge shift from I mean you could go as far as 85 percent LTV at some points uh, depending on the strength of your balance sheet, but uh, exactly what, what Doug was saying, that's down 60, 65, and those LTVs are down, the spreads are pretty wide. Uh, you know, you've got full recourse loans available up to five and a half percent, non-recourse, you're getting close to 10%. It's, it's pretty costly now, especially for an offshore investor trying to come in and, and, and get acquisition into the States. Uh, for us, we, you know, we even had people talking about operating cash reserves for up to 18 to 24 months, which is a fair amount of cash to have sitting aside in the bank on top of, you know, the, 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 the acquisition and CapEx required. And that's typically our model where we'll come in and we'll take an asset that we believe is either underperforming or, or requires repositioning, uh, rebrand and redo so to, to better cater to that market. And we, from a cash perspective, that, you know, potentially themselves. 
believe we may have really lost you great there. opportunities in, in LA. I think so. we've lost Tim there. We will um you, you, we heard the majority of your answer, Tim. So we will. Um, I'll move on if that's okay, and perhaps come back to you um, in a in a short amount of time. So let's let's move on to Vajrana, please. And um, what kinds of um, loans have you been uh, agreeing recently, and how have you been finding the banks? Well, I mean, to to mirror what the, to echo what everyone's been saying, it's it certainly hasn't been easy. Uh, we we have restructured quite a few of our existing. Uh, hotel loans, obviously by introducing Sybil, and um, and you know nothing's without its challenging uh, challenges. Um, I would again echo what Dan said, which is the the eligibility criteria that the government, especially in the UK, has um, has come up with, has just meant that some properties weren't eligible, even if they were clearly impacted by by COVID. So that's certainly made things a lot more challenging. Uh, I would agree that there are some debt funds out there who are selectively looking at hotels and they're seeing obviously more opportunity, but obviously pricing is also reflected. So where some of the debt funds pre-COVID used to be in the force margin, they've now been quoting at, you know, seven, eight, nine percent, which is, um, you know, which is really challenging. And we do some work on the asset management side also for, uh, for like a private family office that does mezzanine and pref equity. And on the on the writing side of things, and again, you know, they they ended up picking up quite a lot of business in the mess piece where the senior wanted a reduction. So, so yeah, I mean, we closed one on Friday, and we're literally drawing down today. So very very pleased that you know things are still moving, but uh, but obviously the new lockdown restrictions mean that you know all the the budgets and things like that we've been putting together, and obviously the operational shortfalls will probably have to be revisited. A few months down the line. So I guess the hope is that the government uh, extends Sybil in the UK for at least another few months because it's currently meant to finish end of November. Mm -hmm. And um, some hotel owners may even um, consider pivoting to a brand. And I'd like to ask you, Vajrana, whether you are seeing much interest or uptake in these in franchise agreements or moving to a brand. So as you know, we, we do equally, you know, boutique hotels and, uh, and franchise style deals. Uh, I would say that brands are certainly have given a lot more comfort to the general public staying at hotels and the pickup has really been in a, a lot of the properties we'll, we'll look after has been better with the help of the brand and obviously, but at the same time, the brands are, make your life sometimes very difficult. And there's some of the, there's some of the, re the requirements that they've wanted to impose on us in terms of just serving breakfast and things like that and what was allowed and not allowed. And we have had to have a fight with the brands, you know, to try and come up with something that's, that's reasonable from an operational standpoint. And that doesn't cost so much that it's just unviable. So, you know, I mean, our slowway property in Waterloo has actually done much better, bizarrely, than, uh, than the London average. And going back to what Dan was saying earlier today about extended stay, I think apart hotels have certainly held up a lot more strongly than some of the, the more traditional hotels, because the extra immunity has certainly helped a lot. But um, going back to your main question, I think it's really a mixture. I think we, it remains, you know, location, location, location and product offering. And I think there's still some space for boutique hotels, but certainly the brand does, does help these days. And, um, and I said, you know, when it comes to our Manchester property, we have decided to brand it uh, instead of just doing it as unbranded, which, um, yeah, gives a bit more comfort, I, I suppose. Thanks, Vajrada. And I'd like to um, hand over to Patrick now, um, looking at boutique hotels specifically. What are you seeing in terms of financing properties based in urban and rural destinations? So looking at location as well. Well, we, we, what we're seeing, I uh, think generally, is a distribution of, of customer demand to out of town hotels which have been performing pretty well. Um, I think a lot of the comments so far has been on urban hotels, but we were recently working on a transaction in um, California, in Palm Springs, where the hotel um, that was looking for a refi of an existing preferred equity position um, had seen, that hotel had seen occupancy go up 
um, year on year by 25% um, through July, August and September. Um, it didn't really help um, to, to create the best financing terms because even though on the supply side, you might have some outliers who are doing really well, the on the demand side where the capital is, what we're seeing is a competition for capital and those investors are able to evaluate opportunities um, which span the, diff the, the risk spectrum. Uh, and they're trying, I think, to find the best risk reward uh, balance. And that is probably for subordinated risk is probably aiming into the high teens in terms of uh, what kind of return they're looking for. At the moment, and that means for PREF, equity, and for mezzanine. I think for equity itself, there's there's probably a higher hurdle um, that investors are looking for than high teens is probably um, into the twenties at the moment. Um, the the basic, um, I'd say, um, demand is generally also not to aim at subordinated risk. Um, what we're seeing from investors is a desire to go in either senior level or even produce some sort of senior, super senior gap funding that would help to tide through those hotel owners over the next six to 12 months. The, the, there is still though quite a big bit off the spread in terms of what sponsors or asset owners are willing to pay or accept financing and what investors want to get and we've seen two or three transactions break down because uh, the gap has been too wide bridge so i think next year there will probably be a um will obviously be very dependent on what the actual pandemic um situation is but if it if the travel restrictions continue what um currently is more of a financing requirement from quite a lot of boutique hotels is probably going to become more of a distressed asset opportunity for the investor market. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, are, are there many owners um, looking to refinance at the moment and how easy or difficult is this? It's, it really depends. The, uh, a lot of the standard thinking has been turned on its head because uh, you know whereas a lot of the um, the market analyses was based around budget uh, boutique you know business luxury um, extended stay categories before now the dynamic has been you know are you in an area of density which means in an urban environment um, or are you in an area of low density, which means out of town? And so a lot of the um, standard approaches ha are, are no longer applicable. I think one of the interesting um, premises going into uh, this particular crisis has been that historically country hotels have done really badly in recessions. And, and right now they're doing really well. So it's been very difficult to, um, to, to apply standard thinking to the situation and, and opportunistic investing is what's going on. Thanks, Patrick. And I would like to remind everyone that they can uh, post their questions using the chat function and I will get round to asking these in a short while. Um, I would like to direct my next question to Doug, please, um, as I know that you guys have a a uh, particular focus on nascent hospitality brands. And I'd like to ask, how are you identifying long-term viability and where are you seeing the opportunities for investment? Uh, thank you. Let me, I wanna add one additional point to Pat's comments. We're seeing in the States and in North America, the same phenomenon of, you know, what we characterize as drive to resorts performing relatively strongly and certainly the, so the premier select service and extended stay markets are, are outperforming a lot of the urban markets. Um, 
you know, pivoting to new hotel brands and concepts, we've been active in the market here and we'll ra- we've been raising equity at the company level, uh, you know, almost more uh, venture capital than traditional real estate capital, as well as in uh, for individual real estate assets and portfolios, as well as uh, investment programs for a variety of uh, relatively new business concepts. Um, and what I would say we look for in these businesses, because real estate investors generally are not venture capitalists, and they really don't want to take risk that looks like operating business risk. They want to anchor their underwriting in the performance of real estate assets. So without a doubt, what we look for first is what we call proof of concept. We want to see that the operator has opened one or more properties, that they're able to demonstrate the ability to generate revenues, and that there is a either profitability or a very clear path to profitability for those concepts. Absent that, it is very hard to raise real estate capital around new concepts. Um, Then we look at sponsorship. We want to see experience, financial commitment, uh, depth in the management team to be able to really execute on a strategy. We're always a little bit leery when, you know, you you see a new hotel concept and then you start to peel back the layers and what you find is really no depth and ability to deliver on things like yield management and service and, you know, all the things that a traditional hotel brand offers, we don't expect to see, you know, what you might see for a Marriott or Hilton or an Accor hotel, but, you know, you do need to see some management depth there. And then finally, people want to see a pipeline. Um, You know, nobody really wants to make an investment in a single asset or one or two assets. They want to feel like I'm going to put 50 to $100 million to work and I'm going to do that over the next 24 to 36 months. They want to see an actionable pipeline. So um, those are really the three broad criteria that we look for. Um, you know, we've raised money for uh, 21C Museum Hotels. That was a brand of, uh, you know, based around a concept that uh, included a, a gallery in all our hotels, uh, really an art museum in every single property. Um, and we were successful there and ultimately advised them in the sale of their, of a majority interest in the company to Accor a couple of years ago, um, a company called AutoCamp that operates, uh, RV parks with Airstream trailers. We're currently raising capital for a company called Collective Retreats that is more of a, a tent or tented villa concept and positions itself at the luxury end of the market. So you know, a variety of boutique concepts. Um, And we're still seeing what's interesting is the out, a a lot of these newer concepts right now are targeting those, those country markets, those resort or drive to markets. Um, So as an example, AutoCamp has got a project that they opened a year ago in uh, just outside of Yosemite National Park in California that project um, is performing at a at a level where they're generating a about a 12 to 15 percent return on their development costs. So they are ahead of their original pro forma and achieving high occupancy at very high rates. Uh, Collective Retreats has got properties in Texas and areas around New York City. Um, California, all of their properties are outperforming their budgets in 2020. So there are, you know, there are, as Pat was saying, there are these outliers that are getting the benefit of people wanting to get out of urban areas and, uh, you know, have a, have a business plan to address that requirement that is actually quite successful right now. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Doug. And I would like to uh, direct my next question to Patrick, please. Um, when do you expect that we will see distressed assets 
and who do you think will be on the lookout for these kinds of properties? Well, thank you for that question. The the, the market is is generally um, structured along Bobco lines, and I think I will I will defer to someone like Dan on this point. But I, I, it seems to me that the the Propco universe is more stable and, and 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 better structured than it was going into two thousand and eight. However, you. Know, we don't know how bad things will get and how much the V is going to move down potentially from where loans have been made over the last few years. But it seems to me the Propcos are uh, generally in, in better shape, apart from some obvious um, victims in, in, in sectors that we sell into. Um, so, you know, that is a positive what what is perhaps a little bit more at risk is that the optos uh, themselves particularly in boutique hotels are not um big enough or old enough to be really well capitalized and able to withstand a prolonged downturn in business but obviously occupancies in places like london are running at 10 or 20 percent um, for those hotels that are open and that is clearly unsustainable um, for many, many operators for more than nine to 12 months maximum. Um, so what we have seen is, is in um, sub-markets like Shoreditch, we've seen uh, like the Curtain Hotel, which was a transaction that we had worked on. We've seen the operator of that hand in the keys and, and uh, the owners of Ruben Brothers have uh, recently appointed uh, the Mondrian Hotel to take over. And it's a, 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 a simple shift from a very thinly capitalized operator to a much bigger um, accord backed operator. And that's something that we're probably going to see a little bit more of, is my view, uh, depending on how bad the market gets. And it's not clear whether it's going to get worse or it's going to get better, um, that we could see um, distress happening probably more likely next year. Mm -hmm. And off the back of your comment um, about the curtain, I've recently heard that the Conduit, which is a private members club in London, has also fallen into administration with its lender now calling in the debt. And Dan, I'd like to um, direct this question to you, please. In that, do you think that we will start to see more of this same activity um, from, from lenders? It's a good question, Eloise, and yeah, Patrick, cheers for sending that one my way as well. Um, but um, it is always sad when you see good hospitality businesses fail, you know, it is sad. And I think, you know, from the lender perspective, the last thing we want to be doing is to be taking on hotel operations. You know, there, there probably are a few bankers out there who fancy themselves as front of house or as a hotel owner. But Generally speaking, we think that hotel operators should be operating hotels, you know, their best place to do it. Uh, and banks definitely don't want to be stepping in unless there's, um, you know, a, a real issue there and they really have to. It's a kind of uh, approach of last resort. Um, but I think there are loads of factors that are going to contribute to, to how many more of these that we see. Um, how long is this pandemic going to last, I guess, being the fundamental one? Um, you know, how quickly are we going to get a vaccine? Is it going to be effective? Um, how many more lockdown measures are we going to see coming into play? Um, you know, again, we took, go back to it, but the announcement at this weekend, you know, things are things are getting get worse before they get better. Um, and then sitting alongside that, what are the government measures that they're going to be bringing in to support? You know, there was an announcement of furlough, wasn't there, alongside the, you know, the extension to furlough alongside this latest lockdown. And some of the government measures that have come in, certainly in the UK, have been pretty good in terms of business rates, holidays, you know, VAT reductions, tax deferrals, all that kind of thing. That So the support is there at the moment, but how long is all that support going to last? And I think that's going to have a, a big impact in terms of, of how many distressed situations we're going to see um, into the new year. Um, I think, as I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm from the lender perspective, but I do think banks have been supportive. Um, there, there have been some deals that have been unravelling. 
um, and generally those have been the more highly structured ones um, that were that were put together at the peak of the market. You know, um, there are you know ground lease structures. You've got the high leverage positions, that kind of thing, and that tends to be where some of these deals are unraveling at the moment. Um, and I think that cash is fundamentally important to these deals. Interest cover is sacrosanct uh, from a lender perspective. But while you do have these more highly structured deals, um, there are also a lot of borrowers now who are a lot more lonely, uh, lowly leveraged um, than they were in the GFC. You know, I'd say on the whole, loan to value levels are a lot lower than they were in the sort of 2006, 7, 8. So you do have a lot of borrowers out there who have built up uh, considerable equity and considerable cash equally as importantly and are actually pretty well placed to try and ride out this storm. Thanks Dan. And Vedrana, please may I ask this question uh, to yourself. Uh, with Seal Capital Asset Managing, uh, what would be your top advice for delivering maximum return on investment? I mean, I guess right now, I think there's a, there's a short term and there's a medium term strategy. I think the short term strategy is really staying alive and trying to make sure that, you know, the operation, you break even. So keeping a very, very tight ship, um, obviously trying to pick up as, as much business that's allowed since Saturday, sadly. Um, you know, social media, I think, is very, very important. We've, uh, we've seen some really, really nice pickup from investing in social media. And uh, yeah, really uh, sitting on your, on your hotel managers to, to ensure that they sweat things as hard as possible whilst keeping things lean. But I mean, medium to long term, we're, we're still very confident that hotels generally will continue attracting uh, people. You know, they're, they're here to stay. How much, you know, future corporates will continue to travel as much as they did pre-COVID is yet to be seen. But I'm a huge believer that... Uh, you know, we're human animals and we do need to interact and see people. And there's no such thing as, you know, cutting cutting deals over Zoom. It's just not the same as sitting with someone face to face. So, so yeah, I guess keeping a tight ship and uh, surviving and then coming out on the other end. And, you know, as, as you were saying, and as everyone's been saying, I mean, I think repositioning strategies going forwards will be quite quite interesting. Um, I think we're likely to see less hardcore, like as in ground up developments happening in the immediate term, which will create other opportunities, I guess, because the competition is likely to be less than it would have been if, if it wasn't for COVID. But, um, but repositioning is certainly what, what we're going to be uh, targeting. Thanks, Vajrana. And I've had a question come in from Vikas Hotwani, which I'd like to um, ask Tim, please. Um, it's all about Airbnb. Um, they've been able to come out of this pandemic much quicker and acclimatise themselves better than the hotel sector. Are there any learnings from them that we can imbibe to rejuvenate and recover the hotel sector? Well, they're obviously a very asset light model, right? So in terms of being able to pivot quickly, I think they, they have the opportunity to do that. Uh, the way they restructure, I suppose, their operations. That they've been up against, uh, obviously, a lot of changes in regulations too. Uh, one of the reasons why, from a hotel perspective, you know, we continue to look at New York uh, because of a tightening of those type of regulations, because of uh, the unfortunate uh, reduction in inventory that is going to come because of COVID. We're already seeing that in New York, especially. But uh, look, I think they are. Uh, 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 mobile so I think in terms of them being able to, to to change their dynamic pretty quickly that is certainly something that was in their favor um, from a development point of view I think they would have shrunken a lot of their teams from their development and expansion point of view uh, but when they've looked at being able to you know uh, address these markets and these niches where you know you are getting we're seeing the same thing that what Patrick described about country hotels what, what Doug was describing about uh, outside city locations, the glamping and all those type of things. We're seeing it in Australia with our portfolio there. Uh, anything that's within a, a couple of hours drive of, of an urban center is doing quite well. Um, and, you know, you, you've got uh, wineries around, uh, around Sydney and New South Wales and things that are having record years. Now, you know, those type of things aren't going to be seen everywhere, but living like a local and experiencing those kind of out of the box activities is what Airbnb kind of built there. A foundation on once they started to pivot to those Airbnb experiences. So 
Look, I think in the hospitality landscape, you always want to be dynamic in terms of what you're offering and, and address what the market is currently asking for, or uh, I suppose what, what where the demand is coming from. Um, look, I think what you learn from is being agile. Don't don't just kind of uh, crawl under a rock and hope that the situation will go away. I think that's a, a learning. Um, just making sure that you you are on top of your business model and and, and making the most of, of the situation. Now, I think. One thing is very different. It's not a supply-induced decline. Obviously, at this point, it's a demand-induced decline. So there will be quite a significant rebound and pent-up demand once that flexibility comes back. So it's putting yourself in a position to be able to capitalize on that uh, when that does, uh, does occur. Thanks, Tim. And I had a question here from Four Corners Hospitality Group, which I would like to direct to Dan, please. In light of the opportunist, opportunistic acquisitions, what is your view on the discount factor that's being looked at for these acquisitions? Um, it's a good question. It's a difficult time to be a, a valuer out there, I suppose, and, and to be looking at how much the hotels are worth because there really hasn't been much in the way of transactions in the past few months. Um, we see, I guess we see a range, of, it's difficult, isn't it? It depends where your asset is. It depends on, on the asset itself as well. So, I mean, we're seeing reductions from kind of 15 to 25% in terms of some valuation numbers coming through, but what they're based on, as I say, is, is quite hard to, to judge. Thanks, Dan. And I have a question here um, from someone who's opening, uh, planning and uh, opening a boutique hotel in Cancun. So I'd like to ask this question to Patrick, please. How would one go about getting a 2 million US dollar loan and to whom must we present this plan? A uh, good question. The, the issue that a lot of investors have um, with going outside dollar, sterling, euro markets is, is Firstly, one of currency risk, and it does end up adding quite a lot of um, extra cost to a loan. I think the, I'm going to slightly put this out there, I think the dollar peso basis cost is, I'm going to say around 8% per annum. So you have to add that on to what would be the normal cost of a dollar loan, because the lender would want to hedge his currency exposure. So it makes it quite tricky. And then secondly, there, there are going to be jurisdictional um, questions about uh, local markets like Mexico. But is there, is there a, a, a lending market into that uh, country? The answer is yes. Um, we've worked with, um, in particular, and, and Doug, might have a, a couple of views on this as well, but we've worked with a couple of family offices based out of Miami, which are uh, which is a center of Latin American investor um, capital, uh, and we've worked we've talked to them about that kind of transaction. Main problem, um, I'd say, whoever asked that question, is that two million dollars is a very small ticket for most investors to write. And in order for it to be worth their while, there would have to be, I, I would normally expect a very high return on that investment to compensate for the small quantum of it. And yeah, also, let, me, let me add a, a yeah. refinement to that. I agree with what Patrick is saying. It's, as a practical matter, that's an equity investment. A $2 million investment is really only going to appeal to a family office investor. There's no institutional market, uh, you know, Central American, South American, or North, you know, North American for, uh, for a loan of that size. So you really are looking at family offices. And I do think that the advice to look in places like Miami, where you do have a pretty large community of investors that are been active in the Caribbean, have been active in the Mexican markets on the Caribbean side of Mexico, is uh, that is good advice. But it's, I, you know, I would say the cost of capital there is well in excess of 15%. 
Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Patrick, for that. I'll, I'll ask one final question, please, before we wrap up our conversation. I'd like to send this one over to Padrana, please. Um, how have development pipelines been affected by the pandemic? The construction industry hasn't slowed too badly, but are hotel projects being delayed over financing slash lending issues? So in, in very short answer, yes, there's been quite a lot of delays. I mean, any development project that has already, or that was on site or had funding committed obviously prior to, to COVID has continued on. Um, we're on site at the moment with, uh, with well, two, one of, well, actually three in total pre-COVID and one of them obviously, P well, PC'd a few weeks ago, but, uh, you know, all of them have obviously taken longer. Not by much, you know, but most of the delays were, you know, a few weeks. One of them is a couple of months, but obviously that's, that's meant that we've needed more money because, you know, higher interest costs and, and, uh, and obviously when things take longer, they tend to cost a little bit more. I would say that uh, a lot of the, the exist, well, the existing pipeline that has not yet commenced is likely to be delayed. I think it, it's not so much just the lack of senior financing. It's also investor confidence. And, you know, am I doing the right thing in terms of redeveloping or developing my asset right now? Um, our, per, our view is that if you're redeveloping something, it probably is the right time to do it because keeping the hotel open right now probably doesn't make an awful lot of sense. And investing and gearing up towards reopening when things hopefully start recovering and we're, we're back to a certain level of normality certainly makes sense. But, um, but certainly ground up developments are, I believe, going to be slightly more challenging. I mean, as, as Dan was saying, a lot of the senior lenders are still lending, but very, very selectively. And um... thank you. Thank you. And thank you uh, to everyone who has uh, submitted their questions. Unfortunately, we can't quite get around to answering them all, but I'm encouraging everyone to connect with our trailblazers over LinkedIn and we can carry on that conversation there. So we must wrap up now. And I just have a few slides to run through before we do close off. So our final webinar in the Trailblazer series is going to be held in two weeks time on Monday, November the 16th, when we are be going to be looking at boutique hotels and a sustainable future. So if you're interested in joining, the link is going to be in the chat for you to register. And our next webinar in the Urban Living series, uh, kindly sponsored by Res, Res Harmonics, is happening this week on Wednesday, the 4th of November. And here we are going to be exploring prop tech and new real estate models. So once again, the link to register for this session is going to be posted in the chat. As I mentioned earlier, our Urban Living Light events are now taking place the week commencing the 1st of March. And do check out the full lineup. The first few events are on your screen now. And we will, uh, the link to all of these events are once again in the chat. And these uh, smaller intimate um, events are being held in the run up to the Urban Living Festival at the beginning of July. And here's some of our sponsors and our media partners for this in-person event and huge thanks to them all. So if you would like to hear more, please do get in touch with my con uh, colleague Katie. Her details are all up on your screen now. So thank you all to everyone who has joined us. Thank you to Vedrana, Patrick, Tim, Doug and Dan for all your input. It's very much appreciated. And we will be emailing a copy of the recording to everyone that has registered. So please do reach out across any of our social media channels. We would absolutely love to hear from you. And in the meantime, look after yourselves and we will see you all back here in two weeks time. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Eloise. Take care, everybody. Thanks, all. Thank you. Cheers.